since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Amen. Thank you, Elijah. It's a great day to be able to worship God, and uh, you may realize we've got some of our people in El Salvador, and so be praying for them. Uh, they will be coming back tomorrow, and so they are, uh, have been doing all kinds of things and helping people there, and uh, I know you have been thinking about them this week. Just one thing you may not be aware of is... Uh, you might especially remember Curtis Allen. He was mugged while he was down there, and they took all of his money. And he was there for a while. Several people would not stop and help, but finally one person did. I think he was mugged seven times that week in five days. They're doing the story of the Good Samaritan, if you didn't get it. So pray that the children got it. I know that's a shock, maybe, but uh, you might think about how that story went over for them. So I didn't know Robin was Samaritan. We've been talking about abundance for a little bit and trying to understand what that means. And first of all, we talked about God being a God of increase and how God is always wanting to give more. And we tend to think of more and more and more in our society. And so we go for the more and we go for God's going to give me, but God's going to give abundance. It isn't just that he wants you to have more than last week. It's more life. Because eventually you get to a point where, you know what, I don't need any more. But we do need more God. We do need more of this abundant life that God is able to give. And so when God talks about uh, being a God of abundance, that's who he is. He's a God of increase and a God of abundance to where you can be completely satisfied, completely content with your life and the place where you find yourself now. Because you realize God has blessed you and God has given you and that you have enough. And Paul says, I know how to be content in every circumstance. And so some people today have learned that as well. And so last week we talked about how it goes from small to great. And we just need to understand that completely. The fact that it does go from something that is very, very small to something that is great. He has the idea of a mustard seed for a kingdom growing into a great tree. Do we think about it that way or do we think, well, you know what, I don't have enough? Well, that's the whole point. I mean, God works to give you what you need and to give you this abundance to where you feel blessed by him and where you know your life has all of the things that he gives. And so it's that kind of understanding that God works that way. If you don't have, then obviously you've got the small part, right? That's where you are. And God's going to make that and increase that and be able to say, you've got everything you need. And so as we look at our church now, we have enough people. We have enough money. We have enough talent. We have enough of everything where we are now. But God gives increase. And God makes more. And we understand that's the way church works. That's the way people's lives work, is they get more abundance. And that's what God does. And that's the whole plan for church. That's the way in which your life works as well, is that God gives abundance and that there is a fulfillment of life that is coming. And that's what he's trying to give you. Today we want to talk a little bit more about abundant grace and what does that mean. Well, I just read the passage to us, but before this passage, looking back in chapter 4 a little bit, it talks about the faith of Abraham, and it talks about how this promise was given to Abraham because of his faith. 
And so God promised that he would have a child, that all families of the earth would be blessed. Abraham has no child for a long time. But he says he believed God in hope against hope. And as he got older and older, he realized, you know, it's really not too probable that I'm going to have a child. But he still believed in God. He still kept the nursery. He still knew that that was what was going to happen. And God said, I'm going to call you righteous. He changed him to a place of grace because he believed what God has promised, even if it was impossible. And sure enough, that promise came true. And he ends chapter 4 by saying, and you can have the same thing. Because God has made promises, and you are able to see those promises come true if you believe in God. And then he starts, therefore, since you have now been justified by faith, we have peace. Same peace as Abraham. Same relationship with God. We have peace with Abraham through our Lord Jesus Christ. And by this faith, we have come into this grace into this abundant grace. And that's what he's trying to get across. We get into or we access grace by faith because we believe in God, because we know that's right, because we are able to do those things and say, I believe and I understand God is going to be able to accomplish this, whether it's true now or not. But that that's exactly what happens. He says it even comes to the point where we can rejoice in suffering. That's pretty hard. How do you rejoice in suffering when it hurts? When things have happened and you don't like it and you don't like the way it is now. And, but we rejoice in suffering because we know what it's going to do to us. It's the same thing as Abraham. We know the promise. We know how it's going to turn out. We know everything is going to be better than this. And so he goes through the whole list of of how he describes this, suffering brings endurance because we learn how to hang on and we wouldn't get endurance without that. He said not only do we get endurance, but that's what makes character. It makes people who are able to understand, who are able to hang on, who are able to be secure, who know the promise is coming, but it's just not here yet. And he says it makes hope because we believe in God's promise. And we live a life that we are full of character and hope and endurance and faith. And God blesses. Because absolutely all of those things come about. He says he's poured out his love into our hearts through his Holy Spirit. And so why not rejoice in suffering? Because you know it's making you a better person. You know it's doing something to you. And it's making you into someone that is so much better than the place where you are now. It's still hard, isn't it? That's what happens to us. And we, and we tend to think about, yeah, but it hurts now. You ever seen whiny kids? Mommy. What does it take to be able to grow up and to get past that stage? It takes knowing that it's going to get better. That's what it takes. You have to believe it's going to be better. It hurts right now. I got a splinter, but it's going to be okay because I'll take the splinter out. It's not that big a pain. And we understand that. He says it goes even to the, what God does because that's the way in which God works. The next passage in Romans 5 that he talks about here. He talks about this sin and Jesus and how he works with this. For he says, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
And so he first starts out with this whole idea of gospel, and this is really what it's all about. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. God sent his son before we had ever repented, before there was ever anything good in us. And so Christ died for us while we were still enemies. And all of those things, being sinners and enemies and ungodly, are people who were against God, but he paid the price for us then. And we have been justified by his blood, saved from the wrath of God. And that's because Jesus took our place. He died on the cross for us. He's the one who gave his life and paid the price. Our sin made it where the only way to get out of sin, to be forgiven of sin, was for us to die. There was a death required. And Jesus says, I'll be the one who takes that. I'll be the one who does that. Because after all, we don't live long after we die, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. But Jesus had no sin. And so death could not hold him. It's an amazing concept, this concept of grace, that we get the benefit because of a price that has been paid by somebody else. It is an amazing way to look at life, an amazing way to think. But more and more people don't think of it that way. They think it's just lucky. It isn't that there's grace. It's just, well, some people got lucky. I want to take you back to the cross, if you'll think about that with me for a minute. And the time when Jesus was captured and taken before the trial, and Pilate was trying to release him, and you know, as he tried to release him, he said, well, I can't find anything wrong, but we always release one prisoner at this time of the year, and so how about if I release Jesus? They said, no, crucify him. We want you to release to us Barabbas. Well, Barabbas was a, a robber. He was one who had done insurrection. He was a murderer. He was, he was a pretty bad guy. They said, release to us Barabbas. It's a choice between the two. Should we crucify Jesus? Should we crucify Barabbas? They said, you crucify Jesus and you let Barabbas go. Did Barabbas get grace? Jesus died in his place. Barabbas walked out a free man. Not that he wasn't still guilty, he just was no longer in custody. I'm not sure if that took care of his legal agreements or not. But he didn't have any faith. This isn't grace. But Jesus did literally die for Barabbas' crimes. And then it was done. Barabbas walked off and said, wow, that was lucky. It was not grace. It was nothing to do with grace. It was not a blessing from God. There was no faith that took him there. We are not saved by escaping. And I think sometimes that's what we feel like grace is. is the fact that we have escaped the punishment. And that's all grace really is. I mean, Jesus was punished for us, and so now we're no longer punished. That's it. That's not very abundant. That's not really grace. Otherwise, Barabbas would have been given grace, and he was not. Grace is a much bigger concept than escaping the consequence. So I want you to think with me about this for a minute. Grace changes the justice system. Barabbas was guilty because of law. You're not supposed to kill. You're not supposed to steal. Grace changes the justice system to a system of faith. Sin makes us guilty. But the one who believes is the one who is set free. Is the one who knows God's promise. God says, now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What does he mean by that? 
now that we are, rec after we're already reconciled, we're saved by his life? I thought that was the whole point. If we're already reconciled, then why do we need any more saving? Because if we've already been reconciled, then our sins are taken away, and that's not the way he talks about it. When he talks about abundant grace, he says, even after your sins are forgiven, you can be saved because of the life of Christ, because of who he is, and that makes a huge difference. Because abundant grace first deals with sin. We need grace to cover our sin, that's true. And grace is when Jesus paid the price for us, and he suffered our consequences. And abundant grace is because grace is applied to all of life. Not just the mistakes. Not just the things that you've done wrong. But a lot of people might come to that conclusion and say, well, you know, so abundant grace, I mean, you get more grace, so if you did a lot more sin, you would get more grace. That's Paul's statement in Romans 6, 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, no. That isn't the way it works. That doesn't give you more forgiveness, more grace, because Jesus died one time for all. One time for all people, one time for all men, one time for everything. And that one sacrifice, as perfect as it was, made it where there weren't any more needed. It is not more grace that is needed. It is abundant grace that is needed. I know, it's a little confusing here. So it was one sacrifice, but abundance of evil does not make gr more grace. Abundance of evil destroys more. Grace abounds more with more repentance, not with more sin. It abounds more with more good, with more giving, with more focus on what is good. And you're able to see that grow more and more. We receive the abundance of grace because of Jesus and because of his life. And so if you think about his life, his life is a powerful life. I mean, he lived and cared about people and loved people and healed people and taught people and did for people and he was loving to enemies. And when you start thinking about a life like that, his dedication to God, his not having any guilt or shame, and, and you know, we can look at that and go, well, you know, he didn't act guilty of anything. He didn't have to feel guilty because he never did anything wrong. And boy, how great would that be to live that way and... Yet that's the whole message, isn't it? You don't have any guilt either because grace has taken it all away because of your faith in God and in his promise that he will do what he's promised, that he did send Jesus, that Jesus is real, that he is the sacrifice for your sin. And this great love of God it says we're not concerned about sin anymore. And he extends grace to more and more people. So abundant grace is not that we need bigger grace. It is because that grace goes to more and more areas of inadequacy. Does that make sense? So let me maybe illustrate this way. We've had a number of young children come to be baptized. Well, the reason for baptism is... To receive the Holy Spirit and so that your sins can be taken away. Right? Did you wonder how many sins do they have? I mean, some of them are, well, maybe not that short, but they're pretty short, right? And so you're going, well, I'm not sure they got a lot. Are they going to appreciate it? Are they going to understand that? Well, this is for them, so make sure they get this lesson. Because it's not just about the forgiveness of your sin. Yes, that's the beginning point. Yes, that's the starting place. But grace goes into your life in a much bigger way. I was one of those. I was fairly young when I was baptized, but I had absolute faith in God. And I know some people later on question that, and they go, oh, well, I didn't know what I was doing. No, I knew what I was doing. I was pretty young. But I knew what I was doing, and I believed. And it was because of that belief that I decided, you know what, it's time. I, I need to do this. That and a few sermons on hell uh, might have helped the process a little bit. 
And, uh, but I didn't have that many things to be forgiven of. Well, not then. I've since made up for lost time, you understand. But that's what happens to us is maybe we start there, but there is so much more that gets to this point. So in Romans 5, 17, let me just pull this verse because there gets to be a lot of things in there. And please go back and read and get all the context. He says, for if because of one man's trespass, meaning Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So just taking that phrase, I mean, he kind of sums it all up in one place. Yeah, Adam caused us to be separated from God. He ruined the relationship, thrown out of the garden. We don't get to go back into the garden. And every single person born after that seems to have inherited that, that separation from God. And so we didn't get it back. We didn't go back to innocence. We didn't go back to the place where God is right there with us. He says, how much more, and I love that phrase because he uses that several times, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace reign in life? What does it mean to reign in life? Well, who reigns? I mean, not reign in the sense of moisture outside because we don't have any of that. Uh, But a king is one who reigns. A king is one who is able to be in charge and able to reign and able to have all of this place. And and he has charge of his life. We understand his rule. We understand exactly what he goes through. And the grace of God in this free gift causes him to reign in life. He's in charge of his life. He has control of his life. He is the one who is the king in his life. What a tremendous thing to be able to see, that we're able to accomplish something that is like that. And so that's what I want these little ones to get, is not the fact that, oh, well, you know, I didn't have that much sin to begin with, but the fact that you now have control. You now reign in life. You are the one who's king of your life. So maybe to illustrate all of this and to, yes, please take care of her. To illustrate all of this and to be able to understand exactly how all of this works, we want to take the example of Paul. He's been talking about resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. And as you think about what he says here on the resurrection, he says he lived and died and was buried and rose again on the third day. And then we understand how he appeared. He appeared to first to some women. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the rest of the apostles. And so, starting in verse 7, it says, Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. So Paul is back to the basics, saying Christ appeared, and he appeared even to me, but I I probably wasn't one that was worthy of his appearance. He says, you know, but Paul did appear to me. He was concerned about me. He did do things for me. And then he goes to this concept, the grace did not prove to be in vain. How could grace be in vain? How could grace be given to somebody and it not mean anything? How could grace be something that doesn't matter? He says, it was in vain. I gave it to you, but you know what? Nothing happened. Well, there is a way in which this happens. He says, because I use that grace, not by sinning more, not by being forgiven more, but he says, I use that grace to change my life. 
And when you think about Paul and you think about the things that he did, if we refuse to let grace change us, we have lost the importance. And it is in vain. If we didn't do anything because we got grace, if we didn't let it change our worship, if we didn't let it change the way in which we approach life, if we didn't let it make us any better, then there's something very tragic about that. If we didn't let... for it forgive us and bless us and change the way in which we think and change the way in which we act? Paul says, you know what? I worked harder than everybody else. Why? Because I had to get to heaven? No. Because I had this grace. I had this abundance. I had this huge blessing of God. And I, I believed and understood that, you know, people who are blessed by him... People who believe in that promise are going to be blessed by him. And it's incredible. And so Paul worked harder. And then he goes on to say, you know what? It wasn't even me who was doing the working. It was the grace of God that was within me. That's amazing. So think with me about the life of Paul. What were his great sins? Well, he had a lot of great sins, and he says, I'm the least, I'm the worst, I'm a terrible, awful person because I was so intent on serving God. Wait a minute, that isn't going to sound like a whole lot of great sin, but that's all of his. I was so intent on serving God that I persecuted the church, that I put people in prison that I did physical violence to them. And all of it came because I was serving God. Okay, maybe that helps us understand with the little kids again. Everything Paul's big sin was about was about the fact that he was trying to do good. He wasn't the drunk He wasn't the drug addict. He wasn't the guy who was sleeping around. He wasn't the guy who had robbed banks. And he was no Barabbas. He was no horrible person like that. But he says, you know what? Grace changed my life completely. Because I was a ruler. I was a Pharisee. I was a person of prominence. But I never started any churches. And it changed my life so that now I am able to go on to that. And we look at his life and we're impressed with his life because that's what he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And and he knows who he is. And yet we read the scripture and we go, wow, that guy's incredible. He says, no, it's not me. It is not me. It is what God does. And that's how it works, that God actually works in people, and we don't need to possess the talent to do it because God gives us the grace to do it. We preach, and you believe is that bottom line. It's that grace of preaching. It's that grace of teaching. It's that grace of understanding more and being able to share that. What an incredible thing it is to realize this is what Paul was like. This is what Paul did, and here's the way in which all of this worked. So much, though, that if you look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, he kind of sums it up this way, and it's a much bigger passage. But just because of time, I'm going to leave it at this. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. I think sometimes in church we're sitting here waiting and hoping somebody good moves in. You know, somebody who's really going to take over and be a really good teacher, a good preacher, a good song leader, and we'll get them from somewhere else. No. They're waiting for you to move so that you could be the good one. 
because you understand the grace of God. And the fact that it is this grace of God that has changed your life so much because you have put it to work, that grace is not in vain. You have put it to work in your life and it has changed you. And it's far more than you ever thought you could do. Every Sunday, my prayer is, God, this is your sermon. I don't know how to preach it. But it'll turn out better if you do it. Through his mighty power that work in us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. All I got to do is stand up here. All you got to do is stand up. All you got to do is walk into that village class and say, okay, I'll teach. All you got to do is be able to be the one on the front line. And the abundance of grace makes your life huge. You reign in life. You reign in righteousness. And it all begins with salvation. That's the beginning point. Paul and Jesus lived great lives, but not greater than yours. Not greater than what God can do with you right now. So it is not that our church needs more people or more things. It's going to get there. It just needs you and God's grace working through you to do things that are exceedingly abundant. If your life isn't abundant now, it's time it started to be. It's time that you were able to have that. Are you bored with life? Maybe you were baptized early and say, I didn't know what I was doing. Or maybe you need to realize now, you know what? I really need to just use the grace of God that I got back then. It's one of those amazing things. Let God do something great in your life. If we can help you with that, whether it's through baptism or or by praying for you or sins taken away or just to give you more courage and faith, would you come while we stand and sing?